Hey, welcome back to another episode of Whiskey Rover. So we are right outside Old Forester Distilling. We have done the tour there. It was really, really cool. The Old Forester tour is one of the most informative, just a really, really good ex explanation of the bourbon making process. Uh, obviously they talk about what makes Old Forester special, but just in general, it's a great process. They have almost this whole mini distillery operation going on inside, which makes it really, really informative. So definitely, definitely check it out. Hope you enjoy the footage. We're in the gift shop. We're waiting on our tour. It's, uh, what's up, Jamie? <laughs> Jamie decided to tag along today. She's kind of a fan of Old Forester 1910s, so it kind of works pretty well. I need an Old Forester sweater. I just, I'm just saying. Oh, look at her breaking the rules right there. <laughs> I'm about to get We're about to get yelled at. So I just decided I quit Whiskey Row. I'm gonna work here and wear an Old Forester sweater and sip on some Old Forester 1910. Day, <laughs> you guys know I love recording in public, so this was a lot of fun. Now in the gift shop, they didn't really have anything particularly special. They had the standard Whiskey Row line, the 1897, the 1870 the 1910, the 1920, they had a Statesman, then they had just the Old Forester 86 and Old Forester 100, but they didn't have any kind of special birthday bourbon or special release in the distillery, which is a little disappointing, but Jamie uh, and I had a great time. That is the actual still that they use, and it was running the day before we were there, but they had started to kind of shut things down for uh, the Christmas break uh, when we got there. Now, Old Forester is actually a very, very old bourbon brand. It was founded by George Garvin Brown, who you see sitting in the suit here off to the right. Back in the day, bourbon was sold medicinally, and Old Forester was actually named after Dr. William Forrester. Also, it was one of the first bourbons to be bottled and sealed for consumer protection. In 1964, U.S. Congress finally dubbed bourbon American Safe Spirit, with that came some rules, laws, and regulations they have to follow. And there are about five rules for bourbon. Unless you pass all five of these rules, you're technically a whiskey. You don't need to call yourself a bourbon. So number one rule, must be made right here in America. Any one of our 50 states, including our U.S. territories, can make its own bourbon. The limestone shelf that's down here in Kentucky is the third largest limestone shelf in the world. Now, second rule for bourbon, it must be aged or matured in a brand new charcoal container every single time. But it does not technically have to be a barrel. That's a common misconception. It's your bourbon. The choice is yours. As long as I can any bubbling that you see is just a release of CO2. Uh, just a heads up though, if you do go on any other tours here on Whiskey Row, I've noticed that some of the tour guides like to refer to these bubbles as yeast farts. Uh, they're technically not wrong, but we're trying to keep it classy here a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is, okay? If you put your hands down close to the mash, you might feel a little bit of heat coming off of it. Uh, so remember, heat, CO2. These are all natural reactions from the activation of that yeast. We're not cooking this, we're not boiling this. If you touch this tank, it's nice and cool. Now it's important to note that only about 10 or 15% of all of Old Forester's product is made in this building. The rest of it is made at our main facility, which is maybe 10 minutes away from here in Shively. That's a neighborhood right here in downtown Louisville. We've been working out of that distillery since 1934, right after the end of Prohibition. Everything that you see on this tour for the next hour or so it's also done over there, just on a much larger, much grander scale. Now, backset is just a stillage from a previous distillation process. So by adding that backset to a new batch of firm every time, we're starting what's known as a sour mash process. That just helps us to keep our flavors consistent over time. Sort of like, a, what is it, sour to bread. We just want to keep that same yeast on hand, same concept. After that, we just leave it alone. We really don't do very much to it. So just yesterday, this tank looked very different. It had like triple the bubbles, they were triple the size. It looked like an even bigger kind of jacuzzi activity that we see going here. It was a very pale yellow color to start with. The smells were different. Um, it starts off with uh, really our grains. Imagine smelling like a big bowl of cornflakes. Now give it a few days, that yeast is eating that sugar, eventually it's gonna run out of sugar to eat. It's gonna start to look a little bit different. It's gonna start to look like what I have all the way down at tank number four. How many days has this been here? This is here, this is probably going into like uh, end of day four, heading into day five, I would say. So this is just about ready. You still see a little bit of activity happening. You still notice some bubbles, but a whole lot less than that first tank. Now we're getting that really deep, rich golden brown. There's still a little bit of heat coming off of this one, but eventually all these bubbles will go away. That heat will dissipate. You get this oatmeal-y kind of film that starts to form at the top. Kind of looks like a big uh, vat of cornbread almost. And the smells are starting to change. So if you walk this towards you, what you're smelling now, that is our yeast strain coming through. Our yeast strain is very fruity. So think like apples, bananas, and pears, especially when we get to the tasting room. 
you'll notice that almost every single old Forster expression has some sort of fruity element to it. Now what we're looking for is about a 10% alcohol content. We're going to get that anywhere between about three to five days. It'll kind of vary from batch to batch. Once we have what we're looking for, this is no longer known as a sour mash. It's now officially known as a distiller's beer. It's at that point that we'll drain what's in this tank and then we'll pipe it up to our still for our distillation process. 44 foot copper still, 24 inches in diameter. This will produce about 100,000 proof gallons every year. We call her Big Penny. Uh, she was just running yesterday. Now at the bottom of the still in our doubler, we're creating steam and that's rising. So once that falling alcohol meets that rising steam, alcohol is going to boil first, turn into a vapor. Those vapors will try to escape off the very top of the still, but instead we're going to catch those vapors in a condensing pipe. We're going to cool it down, turn it back into a liquid, and then it will start to appear in our copper spirit state. First the one on the right there in the form of low wines. Just imagine what would look like clear water coming out of both of those spirit states there. Now, uh, low wine is a, uh, a technical term, a production term. Unless you're on the other side of this glass here, you probably don't call it low wine. Most people refer to this stuff as moonshine. We're hovering at about 110, 120 proof. Uh, some people want to drink this straight off the still. Most people don't. So we distill it one more time. So that whole process I just described, we'll do it one more time, and then that liquid will end up in the other spirit safe to the left here in the form of high wine. Now again, no one really calls it high wine. Most people call this stuff new make, white lightning. I think the majority of people in Kentucky, we call it white dog. All right, welcome to our little mini coop bridge. Now the Brown Forman Company, we do not consider the barrel to be just a storage vessel. It's an ingredient. I'm sure if you've been on any other distillery tours, you've probably already heard it a thousand times. The barrel holds 50% of your flavor, but 100% of your color. So it's for that reason alone that the Brown Forman Company, we choose to make all of our own barrels. Actually, Brown Forming is the only major distiller in the world to own its own cooperage. Other distilleries do have to purchase their barrels from a third party. So remembering those rules for bourbon, bourbon must be aged or matured in a brand new charred oak container. Now first up, making a barrel happens right over here at our raising station. As you can see, our cooper is pretty much already done raising this barrel. It'll take some staves off of this pallet, one in each hand, and sort of start to fan them along that orange circle template that you see there. Now if you look closely at those staves, you will notice they're all different sizes. Some are more wide, some are a little bit more narrow. If you look down towards the bottom of those staves, you'll notice that's really to help our cooper get the tightest fit possible every time we're raising a barrel. We don't use any nails, glue, or staples to hold our staves together. So once that cooper has the tight fit that they need, they'll take a temporary truss or a hoop. You can see there they kind of put along the top of the staves to hold them all together for the time being. Then they're going to flip the whole thing over and bring it over to this machine. Now this machine is called the windlass. It's gonna help us get that familiar barrel shape. We're gonna stick the barrel right underneath like so. Inside this cage is a heating element that's gonna drop down inside the barrel. Now once it drops down, it's gonna to start to impart some indirect heat to all of those staves. Our cooper's also gonna spray down the whole barrel with this water can here on this side. So the combination of that heat and that moisture is gonna make this wood very pliable. It's gonna help us to bend it into the shape that we want without that wood snapping or breaking. Once it's ready, we'll take this steel metal cable that we wrapped around the bottom of the barrel and we'll pull really, really tight, kind of like a tourniquet. So that's how you get the narrow top, the narrow bottom, with the really bulgy middle of your barrel. Now we have to start imparting some flavor into the wood. So that's going to begin with this machine behind me here. This is our toaster. Uh, this is not a complicated machine. It just toasts. It works just like your toaster at home. It's very important that we toast this wood before we char it. There's all kinds of special sugars that are in this wood. That's where a whole lot of your flavor is. So by toasting before we char, we're gently waking all of those sugars up so they're drawn to the very edge of the barrel wall. So by the time we do actually char that barrel, all of that sugar, all of that flavor is going to become right front and center. All right, now we're going to char this barrel for about uh, 15 seconds or so. Once that barrel is done charring, it's going to make its way down the conveyor belt. We'll be sure to put whatever flame might be there out with a quick mist of water. And then we're going to set the barrel to the side, let it cool so it's safe to handle again. We're essentially making like wood print brulee. So by charring the inside of that barrel, number one, we're now allowing that white dog to fully penetrate the wall of that barrel. We're also unlocking all kinds of different flavor notes, chocolate, caramel, vanilla, uh, even deep bitter notes like coffee or espresso will start to come through. Now it's time for all of our permanent irons. So when you look at a finished barrel, what you have is your head iron, your quarter iron, and your bilge iron. Stay from the bottom, just going up. Uh, this machine here on this side looks like a big spider. It's called the Cooper. It's going to use over 4,800 pounds of pressure to 
push all these permanent irons on nice and snug. So once again, remember, only pure pressure is what's being used to hold all these staves together. If you're gonna knock these irons away, it's kind of like Jenga. All of these staves are just gonna topple over. You see a barrel, look at the rivets. It's gonna tell you who made it. If you see a barrel with some bees on the rivets, just know that was made by us. Uh, but we also own this really small time distillery out in Tennessee. They're called Jack Daniels. Have you guys heard of them? A few of you? They're craft. We'll see if they work out. I don't know. But they get two J's or a J and a D on their rivets. Uh, obviously, Jack Daniels is arguably one of the most popular whiskeys in the world. Our mate Cooper is out by the airport here downtown. Over there, they're making something like 2,500 barrels five, six days a week. 20% of those barrels will only be for Jack, but they still need quite a few barrels. They have their own Cooperage in Alabama to help them out, hence the different rivets on their irons. But just know, they're also a brown foreman owned distillery. We purchased Jack Daniels back in 1956. Now this is their on-site aging room or rick house or barrel warehouse, whatever you want to call it. Now it's temperature controlled and they're doing kind of an experiment here where they are leaving everything at a static temperature year round just to see what it does compared to a traditional warehouse where the temperature fluctuates with either the natural temperature outside or they actually use uh, heat cycling techniques to age the barrels faster. All of those warehouses out in the country, they're all kind of open air. So those barrels are exposed to the elements, exposed to the seasons. Uh, now, that is very important for the maturation process. So during the hot summer months, especially here in Kentucky, the wood of that barrel wall will expand and the bourbon will get stuck inside the wall of that barrel. The opposite will happen in the winter. The wood will contract and the bourbon will try to push itself out. Now, even 10, 15 years ago, one of the more common techniques was barrel rotation, which you've all might have heard of, right? Tops of the rig house will be the hottest. They would often rotate barrels from the bottom up to get more of that heat, more of that expansion, ergo more aging. But rotating barrels is very, very time consuming. Not a whole lot of distilleries still do it. You can take samples one of two ways. You could use a big drill to pop out that bung on the side. Use something called a whiskey thief to grab a sample. Like if you uh, use a straw and a, like a, a yeah. glass of water or something. Mm -hmm. The only problem is, is like if you want a sample from that barrel, you have to take all the ones uh, behind it out before you can get to that one. Yeah. So what Jackie will do, which you'll see over here, she'll just take a hand drill. She'll just buzz right into the head of the barrel and have her sample bottle underneath. And then she'll just use like a little wooden cone or a shim and she'll kind of hammer it back in. Now, while we were there, nobody was actually running the bottling facility, but normally there's bottles flying through here and they're being filled with wonderful old Forrester juice and then getting packed. And then at the end of the tour, we ended up going into one of their tasting rooms and we were able to sample four different uh, versions of old Forrester. None of them were special. They were just the standard whiskey row line as well as one of the, I believe it's 100 proof, and then the Statesman. They actually had an original bottle of 1910 here, which you can tell from Jamie's expression, she got pretty excited about. Well, I hope you enjoyed the footage. Uh, like again, the Old Forester Distillery Tour is just, it's just spot on. They've done such a great job inside, really running through the entire process. I, I can't say enough highly, if you come to Louisville, Kentucky, and you want to kind of just see a very abbreviated, but very informative tour of the entire process, Old Forester is a great place to start. If you ended up enjoying the footage, please smash that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And until next time, find a bottle you love.